tonight, and thank you for coming. We welcome you to our Lake Talk of 2021. Um, my name is Karen Saborski. I'm the chair of CLAMA. And this is our sixth Lake Talk. We started these in 2015, so we've tried to go through a lot of different topics. Um, I'd like to start out just by reading our actual mission statement so that people understand who CLAMA is and what we do. Um, the Quinault Lake Aquatic Management Association was formed to develop a program to guide the management of Quinault Lake and its watershed on a long-term basis. Its purpose is to protect Conneaut Lake's recreational, economic, and ecological values, to promote public safety and education, and to encourage a cost-effective aquatic management program. And we've been doing that for 26 years now. I like to read it so I make sure I get it exact so you guys, so I'm not putting any inflection on it. I like to say we keep Conneaut Lake safe, healthy, and beautiful because that just rolls off the tongue a little faster. So we are a volunteer board um, created of all the interest groups around the lake to represent the lake in its whole. We are funded through three sources, private donations, which most of you might have received your fundraising letter in the mail. If you haven't, sign up on our sheet and you'll make sure we'll get you on there for the next time. Um, fundraising events, we normally we operate the Clama Bash and the Clama Dance Party, which through COVID have been canceled, but that'll be on track again next year and the dance for this uh, August as well. And uh, the third way is through grants. Um, a lot of those are more in the background through projects in the watershed to try to help long-term care of the lake and for equipment and fixed projects. <coughs> and the Conservation District really has done a lot with writing grants through the years and getting those for us. So our current program is our most cost-effective way to treat Pontiac Lake. It consists of the herbicide application that we do early in the summertime the harvester that we run that you'll see out on the lake, and our public education so we can choose our actions wisely in the future to try to preserve and protect the value of Cornet Lake. So this program's been in effect for 25 years. We have a great history of that, of our success. Our current harvester is in its 10th year, so we are always looking forward to future needs of that nature. And our current fundraising needs are to raise our annual operating budget and to keep an eye towards those future equipment needs. We like to raise between $55,000 and $60,000 a year. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sydney Holler. Um, she is the feature of our program today. She's a resource conservation technician with the Crawford County Conservation District. Um, she has her BS in environmental science and a minor in geology from Allegheny College. She has experience in the Pine Tuning and Goddard State Parks, where she has worked a lot with the community to increase knowledge on invasive species threats. And with the complex relationship between humans and the environment being a primary focus throughout her education, Sydney continues to pursue this focus by managing the district's delegated responsibilities relating to erosion, sedimentation, and waterway management. While environmental permitting is a main part of her job, Helping Crawford County residents understand and improve their connection with nature is one of her favorite parts of working at the district. So welcome, Sydney, and I'm very excited to see her talk about seagulls, downspouts, and dogs. Oh my. <laughs> Alrighty, everybody. Uh, as Karen said, my name is Sydney. I'm with the Crawford County Conservation District, and I'm thrilled that you decided to spend your Saturday morning with us today. Talking, like we said, about seawalls, downspouts, and docks, and a little bit about uh, property values and how permitting can actually affect uh, those property values. So before we get into it too far yet, uh, I'd like to talk about where these permits kind of come from, where, where these regulations come from. And ultimately, it comes down to the Pennsylvania Code. Now, um, specifically, my job is guided uh, by uh, Title 25, which is environmental protection. There are two chapters within that are the main focus for these permits. Chapter 102 is related to erosion and sediment control, and then Chapter 105 is dam safety and waterway management. Now, I'd like to take a moment here to explain a little bit about our relationship at the district uh, with relation to DEP, or the Department of Environmental Protection, and kind of how all this works. So we are uh, at the Crawford County Conservation District, county employees, uh, however we are delegated by DEP. So basically what that means is we are issuing, the permits that we issue are DEP permits. So because of that, there are some permits that the uh, district can issue and then there's other permits that need to be issued by, the DE, by DEP directly. <laughs> So I just want to bring that up a little bit because as we get into that, we'll talk about a couple permits. Some of them will be coming directly from my office and then other will be coming from uh, the department directly. 
for example, here with Chapter 105, dam safety and water management, I don't have anything to do with dam safety. That is all done, I believe, through central office in Harrisburg, uh, whereas you know, more of the general waterway management permits can come from us directly. So if you hear me say Chapter 105 or 102, that's kind of what I'm referring to. We're going to be focusing primarily on uh, Chapter 105 in this case from, from the waterway standpoint. So a question we hear a lot is why do we need permits? A lot of people think they're a waste of time, they're a waste of money, they're a waste of paper, and I can certainly understand the frustration that some people have with the permitting process. I'll be the first one to tell you, it is not a quick process, unfortunately, and if any of you have went through that process, I'm sure you're very well familiar with that. Um, regardless though, even though it can be a little bit of a slow process, it is incredibly important. And here's why. It basically protects a, a bunch of different uh, perspectives. Well, the obvious one is going to be the environment. But something else that people might not think about is it also protects you. There are certain activities that do require that you have a permit. So by getting a permit, you are making sure that your bases are covered. But on another perspective that this one isn't as obvious as maybe the first two, um, but they also help protect property values, which is gonna be the main focus kind of of what we talk about here today. So with that being said, how exactly do permits help maintain pro property values? It's not immediately obvious, but ultimately it kind of comes down to the fact that there are permit conditions that are outlined in each of these permits. The permit is going to depend on the type of activity, but ultimately if these conditions are followed, they help ensure that the project will reduce the risk of pollution as a result of that project. In this case, pollution, we would consider uh, sediment. That's something a lot of people might not be aware of, but sediment is actually a pollutant. And so when we have pollution of any kind, it's going to be associated with lower property values. Uh, certainly something that none of us want to have. So that's why one of the reasons we kind of have these permits in place. So let's talk about other, uh, some other things that lead to lower property values. Now we mentioned pollution, in this case sediment, but you know any type of pollution is going to be associated with lower property values. But um, kind of tying along with that, dirty water, of course, you know, that does tie into pollution, but even from a visual standpoint, that is not something, no one wants to go out and look at a dirty lake or a dirty stream. It's just not very visually appealing. Um, I see that oh, my little green box there might be a little hard to read, but that says flooding. Um, you know, flooding is also so, often associated with lower property values. And then, um, with regards to algae, uh, we could consider that debris in a sense, and also bad smells. Um, those are all kind of things that can be associated with lower property values. Now, with the exception of flooding, these factors um, all are can be directly related to sediment. And so, uh, don't worry, we're gonna talk a le little bit about flooding as well. But um, before we get to that, we're gonna actually talk about some other effects of sediment. Now sediment is known to increase the turbidity of the water. And basically turbidity is how clean or how cloudy your water is. As you can see this one here, that is you know, relatively clear water, whereas the one on the other side, that is, that's very turbid. Now when we have that turbid water, this makes it very hard to find food if you're a fish or another aquatic organism, but it also makes it very hard for those aquatic plants to, to create their own food. That sunlight can't really get this through as well and they can't photosynthesize like they're meant to. In addition to that, um, it, they, sediment, as it gets into our waterways, it can actually reduce the water depth as it accumulates on that uh, you know, lake or stream floor. When we have that reduction in water depth, that can actually increase the water temperature. And when you have that, that makes it, once again, very hard for these aquatic organisms to survive. If you're a fish or, or aquatic plant or a mussel, sometimes they can only survive in cer a certain temperature range. And so when we get out of that, it, it's certainly a very difficult you know, time for them to, to try to survive. If I was a fish and I was, you know, it's, you can't find your food, you can't see anything, that sediment's clogging your gills, and also it's way too hot, um, it's certainly not something I would be, you know, wanting to, wanting to deal with. Now, as a result of that, there's going to be less fish. There's going to be, a, uh, you know, that ecosystem is going to be impacted. And obviously, when there's less fish, that's going to mean poorer fishing. Um, I know a couple of you probably fish in here, and so that's certainly something we don't want to see. A lot of people come to Conneaut Lake to, to fish, and it's also something that could potentially uh, impact the uh, local economy in a sense. When you have these people coming to the lake, they'll, they'll stop at a restaurant, they'll stop at a local business. Um, and if there's no fish here, that's kind of, you know, helping your economy, I guess, take, take a little bit of a hit. But regardless, let's say you don't care about fish. Let's say you don't do any of that. There's one thing we can all agree on, and that is the fact that clean water is better, better than dirty water. I don't think anyone can kind of argue with us here. I'd much rather be swimming in a beach that has that type of water as opposed to what we have right there. 
Now, um, on to another effect of sediment is uh, benthic algae. So this stuff is nasty stuff. So basically it is fed by nutrients that are found in sediment and it grows on the bottom of the lake beds and it can get dislodged by wave actions. This can just be natural wave action or it can be um, accelerated by motorboats and things like that. When it is dislodged, that is when it can wash onto shore and that's when you'll start seeing this stuff kind of showing up on your, on your shores and um, it smells terrible. It looks terrible. It smells terrible. Overall, just not a very pleasant, uh, very pleasant thing. So, um, like I said, this is all uh, accelerated by sediment. It feeds on that. So by reducing sediment, then you're going to see less and less of this benthic algae. Um, in addition to you know al uh, the, the algae perspective and the fishing perspective, we also need to consider dredging costs. And I'm not even just talking about Pontiac Lake directly. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But for now, let's go ahead and step out and take a look at the bigger picture here. So that sediment that is in Pontiac Lake or its tributaries, it might not always be in Pontiac Lake. In fact, it's probably going to travel down downstream and it'll get into what we consider our larger, or larger, excuse me, more navigable waterways. And with these navigable waterways. That's how a lot of our goods and products are transported. We might not realize that's how it gets to us, but one way or another, I'm sure there's something you and I use every day that is actually transported by that. And so in order to keep those waterways open and functioning, um, the Army Corps of Engineers has to go in and dredge that material out to make sure that it's going to be passable. Now this is an example of um, the Army Corps kind of dredging out there, but to give you an idea of how much that actually costs. So it cost uh, $500 million annually in 1986. So as you can probably imagine, that certainly is probably not gotten any cheaper here today. Um, now, talking about Conneaut Lake specifically though, the Army Corps isn't gonna come here and dredge it out. It's gonna be you folks that are ha ha that's gonna be coming out of your pockets to get that area dredged. So once again, it, it can affect you both directly and indirectly when we think about those, you know, Conneaut Lake itself and those lar larger navigable waterways. Something else we have to consider as far as cost goes is the cost to uh, filter water and to get us clean drinking water. Certainly we, you know, we don't want to be drinking that dirty water. It's something that has to be done, um, but it is going to cost more and more money as we have more sediment in there that is going to take more money, more time, more effort to actually get that clean and to let us actually have um, clean drinking water to use. So once again, that's you know very much a necessity, and if we don't do our part to you know keep our waterways clean, that's going to be an added cost as well. So, in a nutshell, permitting protects clean water. Permitting protects Conneaut Lake, and when we protect clean water in Conneaut Lake, that is going to be associated with higher property values. That is something we we all want. You know, we want higher property values. We at least want them to be maintained, and so that's why it's very very important. Now, we're going to go ahead and jump into some of those common Conneaut Lake permits. I want to emphasize that these are certainly not the only permits out there. There are a whole bunch of permits, and basically, if you are working in or near a waterway, I recommend you guys give us a call. Give me a call. You can call DEP. Chances are they'll, have the, they'll get, tell you to call us anyways. <laughs> um, but basically, give us a call just to be sure. It's our job to help you get on the right track, and if a permit is necessary, we want to make sure you, we get you covered. Um, so I just want to say that we're just going to hit on a couple here today. Um, but if you have you know questions about other permits, certainly certainly let me know. Now, docks are a very common one. Does, who, who in here has a dock? Okay, already excellent. <laughs> I'm not going to ask how many of you have dock permits, don't worry. Um, so dock, docks do technically require permitting. Um, and this is because they can alter the flow path of the water. This, this can, um, as a result, affect fish migration. Um, in addition to that, it, uh, can, excuse me, it can impact aquatic vegetation, mussels. Basically, um, it can really have a big impact on those ecosystems. And maybe your one dock won't make a big difference, but when everybody has a dock, it can really kind of accumulate those effects, um, which is why we require permits. Now, most small docks can be covered under what we call a GP2. GP stands for general permit, and then two is just, it's the, it's the second general permit. I think there's one through 15, so you'll have a whole bunch of different GPs. Each of them are specific to a different type of project. Now, in order for uh, a dock to be considered a small dock, it has to be 50 feet or shorter and have an area of less than 750 square feet. Honestly, most docks out there on Pontiac Lake can be covered under that. Um, however, in the case that uh, there's docks that exceed that, those conditions, uh, it, that just means it would require a, a separate permit that would come from DEP directly. 
Uh, especially if we get into those docks that are, you know, larger ones at marinas have multiple slips. That's looking at uh, a DEP permit rather than a GP2. One way or another, though, they do uh, they do require some type of permit coverage. Moving on to seawalls and bank protection, these guys uh, we see a lot of this, and these permits are extremely important. They're all important, I guess, if you ask me. But these guys are extremely important because these can cause more erosion if they are not installed properly, and that is ultimately the exact opposite of what you know what the cause is when you're actually installing a seawall or doing some type of you know stream stabilization. Now with this, once again, there are a certain set of conditions and one of the conditions is that you cannot constrict or increase the channel width. This is not just be because we're trying to be a pain in your neck. <laughs> it's going to make the seawall um, last longer. It's going to do its job. It's going to ultimately um, be better for your pocket in the long run because it's going to be um, much more effective than in the case that, you know, for example, let's say you do constrict the channel width. You just go ahead and place some concrete blocks. Let's say we're working within a stream here. So that water, you're asking the channel is this big, and you're asking it to go down to something that's that's much smaller than that. So the water, you know, it, some of it will go through that smaller channel that you've created, but ultimately that is going to gain velocity, and as a result, that is going to create a fire hose effect when it exits that area where you have those blocks placed. When it has that fire hose effect, it can actually cause more erosion. It'll erode back, almost create a swirling shape in a way, and it can actually eat back behind your seawall or bank protection. Um, so ultimately, this is why we want to see these, uh, these structures actually keyed into the bank. That way, it'll make sure it lasts longer, it's doing its job, and you know, certainly you know, it'll allow for that smooth continuity. We have a nice smooth transition as opposed to just putting some, a structure in that is not really tied into the existing bank. Now, um, the specific permit for most seawalls and bank protection, these can be covered under a GP3. Um, these are limited to 500 feet in length. If you are going to be going beyond that, once again, it still requires permit coverage. It's just going to require a permit from DEP directly. But I've seen most of, the, most of the permits and most of the projects I've seen so far have been able to be covered under the GP3. Now, this is not the only condition with these permits. I don't want to, <laughs> I, I don't want to put you guys to sleep with all of that, but this is just kind of the main one. It's the same situation for the docks and whatnot. Um, but those are just kind of the, the main tri tri criteria that kind of limits things a little bit. Now, moving on to downspouts. So these guys are very common. I, I think we all probably have downspouts on our homes. And oftentimes with these downspouts, what they do is they concentrate the flow. They have that water that's coming down from your gutters. Um, it's all directed in kind of one direction. And so when we have concentrated flows, this is going to lead to erosion. When we have erosion, there's probably going to be sedimentation. And so that's one reason that certain downspouts are going to require a permit. Now, from an erosion sedimentation you know, perspective, that's one of the reasons they require a permit, but we also need to consider it from a stormwater management perspective. Um, these guys can actually contribute to flooding because it's not allowing that water to infiltrate and get into the ground. It's just going, it can go potentially right back into a waterway, not giving it you know, any time to kind of adjust there. So in this case, we sometimes, we're not delegated at the district when it comes to stormwater management. There is an element of it um, included with certain permits. Um, but regardless, still get a lot of questions. And you know, I, one thing I want to emphasize is that with variances, they should be the exception. They should not be the standard. Um, this is because you know variances are certainly very important. There are certain situations where they are very applicable um, and necessary. But if everybody goes and gets a variance and does not properly manage their stormwater, this is going to lead to bigger problems. It might affect you directly. It certainly will affect your neighbors downstream, and it'll affect their community overall. So I just want to emphasize that these variances are in place for a reason. And by asking for a variance when one isn't truly necessary, you are bypassing a safeguard that is meant to protect your property. I just want to emphasize again that this is meant to protect your property. It might seem, you know, as with all of these permits and all of this stuff, it, it, I can understand how it can be overwhelming. And it can certainly cause us a little bit of a headache. Believe me, it's not just you guys. <laughs> Um, but ultimately, it is for, for your own sake and for the sake of the community, the sake of your neighbors, for the sake of the lake. Now, getting into the specifics of downspout permitting uh, from our perspective. So, not all downspouts are going to require a permit. Frankly, most of them don't. Um, if they do, it's going to uh, come down to ultimately location. So, DEP defines um, 
outfall structures as the outlet of a pipe or channel discharging stormwater or wastewater into a receiving stream or body of water. So uh, once again, not all downspouts are going to fit that uh, uh, description. If you have downspouts, if your home is nowhere near a waterway, uh, you are not going to be required to get a permit because it's not going to be discharging directly into a, a stream or body of water. But for those that are going to be um, within a proximity of a stream or you know uh, discharging directly into a waterway, that is going to require permit coverage. Now, once again, this is going to include if you are discharging water directly into the channel or within the floodway. So I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about what the floodway actually means because I know when I started the district, I, I didn't know what the difference between a floodway was, a floodplain was, what is a floodway fringe, I, I had no idea. And frankly, we're not even going to talk about all of this. We are just going to be focusing on the normal channel and then the floodway here. So as you can see, the normal channel there, the little blue water, that is how the water flows under, under normal conditions. You know, it's when we're certainly not when we have these crazy storm water events and whatnot. But um, that's what you would typically see just at a normal channel level. Now, as you go out beyond that normal channel, that becomes what we call the floodway. And so that, you know, it doesn't go, you know, all the way back, um, but, you know, it certainly is a, it's a good ways outside of that stream. Uh, FEMA has delineated certain floodways. Um, most of them, I'm not quite sure if they've delineated the floodway here. That's certainly something I can look into. Uh, but ultimately, if it's a floodway is not delineated, that is going to be, the floodway is going to be considered 50 feet back from the top of the bank. So let's say this is the top of the bank here. We're going to go ahead and move 50 feet back. This is going to be your floodway. So if your downspouts are discharging within this area, within 50 feet from the top of the bank, that is going to require permit coverage. Once again, this is because, um, you know, in order to help manage stormwater and whatnot, when we don't manage that properly, that is something that is going to affect us down the line. Now, because Conneaut Lake is, all, all waterways in Pennsylvania have some type of designation. Conneaut Lake is designated as high quality. And basically, I'm not gonna get into the specifics of this, but that just means that it, you know, uh, for a certain amount of time, it met certain standards that would allow for, you know, uh, ecosystem growth and, and things like that. So as you can tell, high quality, it's, it's of, you know, good quality, you know, with consideration to certain standards. Um, some other designations include, you know, warm water fishery, cold water fishery, but high quality, and then you'll also sometimes see exceptional value. Those are considered special protection. So these special protection watersheds, they require a permit from DEP directly. Um, you know, in the case that Conneaut Lake was not considered high quality, this would be a different permit, but because it is high quality, that is what makes it uh, require a permit from, from DEP directly. So it's easy to think, okay, is my downspout really gonna make a difference? It's just one downspout, it's not gonna matter. But, you know, it, we run into issues when everybody has that same mindset because cumulatively, it, it will make a difference. You're right, one downspout is not going to matter. But that, when everyone thinks that way and everyone just puts in one more downspout, one more dock, one more seawall, um, cumulatively, that is going to have an impact if these are not installed properly or you know, managed properly. Um, one way or another, we are gonna see those effects and it will impact the, the water quality of the lake. And so that's when we run into that additional sediment in the waterway. We're gonna have more of that benthic algae and overall that's contributing to those lower property values. So let's say, okay, you don't have time for that. You don't have time to get a permit. You're not gonna consider stormwater management. Ultimately, that is going to lead to more flooding and more dirty water, more benthic algae, more um, all of that good stuff that we talked about in the beginning. And ultimately, that is going to be associated with lower property values. But on the flip side, let's say you do you know, contact your municipality about stormwater management. See what their requirements are. You contact us or DEP with regards to any permits that might be necessary. This is going to lead to less flooding and cleaner water. It's going to lead to a cleaner lake. And when we have that, that leads your property values to be maintained. Now, there's a few other things that I want to talk about with these permits. I Don't worry, I'm not going to go through each of the bullet points that need to be met for each of these. But there's a couple things that are pretty consistent for all of these permits. So the first one is called the Pennsylvania Natural Diversity Inventory. You'll often heard, hear this referred to as a PNDI. And this is done through the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program. And like I said, this is something that's required for pretty much all permits. So it ultimately is a search that is um, meant to ensure that no threatened or endangered species would be impacted by the proposed project. 
So this search goes through DCNR, the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, Pennsylvania Game Commission, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And in, and in my experiences with doing these permits, usually this is what it's going to take the longest with that permitting process, just because we are waiting on word back from these other organizations. But basically, they go in. They, uh, you know, do, I'm not entirely sure how they do it, but they do a little bit of research. Sometimes it requires a field visit. Um, it really just depends just to see if, you know, certain species would be impacted. If species are not going to be impacted by this project, we would usually get a letter back that says, okay, no impacts anticipated, you are good to go. And at that point, I'm usually good to issue the permit. Um, in other situations though, when we do get a little bit of a project that might be more invasive, um, that oftentimes they will send us a letter that says, okay, you need to follow these avoidance measures or these conservation measures. And basically sometimes it can be a time constraint where you can only, um, or you're not allowed to work during this time period or something like that. Um, but basically they, they would set those kind of outline or those conditions for you in a way and that's something that need to be followed in, in, in addition to those regular permit conditions. In addition to the PNDI, uh, erosion and sediment control plans are also something that is required for basically all permits. Uh, these are meant to utilize ENS best management practices or BMPs in order to limit the amount of erosion and sediment that we experience. So this all stems from the, once again, it stems from the Pennsylvania Code. That is really where the regulation is coming from. But DEP has put together an erosion and sediment pollution control manual that I use almost every day. It is a great resource. And um, you know, for those of you who, you know, sometimes these manuals can be really you know, overwhelming, but they, really it can be extremely helpful. It's written in a way to kind of help you understand. It's not gonna be you know, over, over anybody's head. It has a lot of great pictures and things like that. So it's something I recommend everybody kind of get into. It's certainly a big manual, but um, there's some good information in it. So some of those BMPs include a couple that I have listed on the screen here. Like I said, these are certainly not the only ones, but these are some common ones that we see with pretty much all um, ENS plants. So the first one is basically minimizing the amount of disturbed area that you're going to have. So instead of, let's say, you have a skid steer and you're just driving it all over your yard, tearing everything's up, um, not that you would want to do that anyways, but, you know, <laughs> whatever there. Uh, but let's say instead of doing that, you actually have a planned pathway, I guess. You're going to have a planned kind of trajectory where you're going to take this skid steer through. By doing that, you're going to minimize the amount of disturbed area. You're going to minimize that uh, exposed soil, and you're, as a result, going to minimize that sediment that is getting into our waterways that are, get, would get into potentially plenty of lake. Another thing we often ask for is working during low flow. If you're doing a project that is actually within a waterway, let's say you're installing a seawall or something like that. We ask that this is done during low flow. When, you know, certainly I don't think it'd be very easy to do it when the water's flowing. You know, that, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense anyways. Um, but by working in low flow, there's not as much water to transport any sediment that might be leaving the area. Sediment barriers are also very, very common. I see them with, with most erosion and sediment control plans. Um, you can see in this picture down here, this is what we consider compost filter sock. And they look like these just big worm things. And um, this compost filter sock is doing exactly what it's meant to. As you can see on this side, it's nice and green, all of the grass, but on the other side here, um, that is where the sediment is. So basically, this compost filter sock is containing that sediment, sediment within the project site. It is keeping it from leaving the project site, which is beautiful. It's exactly what we look for when they're installed properly. This isn't the only type of sediment barrier. There's sometimes you'll see what they call silk fence. Um, and even, even more basic than that, a straw bale barrier is also another alternative. Certainly, this is not necessarily going to be as effective as compost filter socks say, but it's certainly better than nothing. So that, that is another alternative as well. Now, let's say you're working through a project. It's going to take quite a bit of time or something. Um, throughout that, if you're going to have a period of time where you are not going to be, or you're going to have a soil exposed for a period of four days or more, that's when you need to implement temporary stabilization. And so basically, a lot of times that ends up just being straw mulch, something to get on the site to temporarily stabilize it until you can finish that project and achieve permanent stabilization. An area is considered to be permanently stabilized when it's achieved 70% uniform vegetative coverage. I'm not going to push you on that, don't worry. But you know, you, you use a little bit of a judgment call here. Let's say if you took a big hula hoop, threw it on the ground, 
um, you know, does that look like there's 70% growth there? And that's kind of what you can kind of go by. Do you have any big patchy areas? You know, you want to be uniform coverage. So when you have finally get that 70% uh, uniform coverage, that is when a site is considered to be permanently stabilized. And ultimately, in my opinion, this is one of the most effective BMPs because it's um, just kind of how nature works in, in, in general. Um, you know, those roots really hold that soil in place when they're not uh, exposed to begin with. It, you know, we don't experience that erosion and sedimentation like we would when we have exposed soil and whatnot. Now, to kind of wrap things up here, here are a few main bullet points that I, I'd like you guys to kind of take away from this. So sediment is pollution. Um, it can be detrimental to our ecosystems. Permits protect clean water. Permits are going to protect Conneaut Lake. And when we have a clean Conneaut Lake, that is going to help maintain property values. Small docks are going to require a, tip, uh, a GP2. A docks beyond that criteria is going to require a permit from DEP. Seawalls, space stabilization, and also gravel bar removal. I didn't talk about that too much, but gravel bar removal is something that will also be covered under a GP3. Um, and when there are downspouts that are going to be discharging to Conneaut Lake, whether into the channel directly or within the floodway, 50 feet back from the top of the bank, that is going to require a permit from DEP. And basically, you know, I understand this is kind of a lot of stuff to go over. So if you have any questions or if you are working in or near a waterway, please give us a call. I'm more than happy to answer your questions. I'll come take a look at the site with you. That's, you know, ultimately my goal in this. My goal is to help you guys out the best that I can. So basically, that, that's it, everybody. I really appreciate coming out today. So if you have any questions, you know, certainly, certainly let me know. Very, very much, Sydney. We really appreciate that. And I learned a lot. I don't know about you. Um, I'm going to do a short wrap up and then we'll open the floor for questions for either of us. Um, so, like I said, um, Conic Clama um, is responsible for treating the whole lake. We did a little reporting on how the year's been going. Um, we treated the herbicide treatment on June 4th this year. The weather was not the greatest that day, but overall, there was a great application that they got from it. Um, so that was a very successful treatment from what I am told by Bob. Um, we also, there are misconceptions about how much of the lake gets treated. We treat about 7% of the total all overall surface of the lake, um, which is about 26% of the total weed growth within the lake. So, um, and Clama treats the entire lake as a whole for the best of the health of the lake. Um, there's no um, picking and choosing, there's just, we treat the overall lake based on where it needs treated based on how the lake is growing. Um, we also run the harvester, which you'll see out throughout the rest of the summer. Um, our harvester currently is in its 10th year. Um, we're anticipating about a 20 year span with the harvester, so we're about halfway through its time. And we're planning for future needs with our fundraising efforts as we are. Um, our old harvester, I don't say old, our prior harvester operator <laughs> retired last year, um, Jim Hunt. He did a great job for many, many years for us, and we really appreciate his service. Um, we have a crew of three this year, headed by John Tracy, along with Joe Christ and Dean Martin, and they seem to be doing a great job so far this year. Um, we held off most of the week with the no-wake zone, so we didn't do a lot of treating this week, but we'll be back in full force on Monday. Um, one of the things that comes up with the harvester all the time is complaints about floaters. And the misconception is that all these floaters are coming off the harvester. While it does give some floaters, most of the, the weeds floating on the lake are coming from weeds that were cut off by boat crops. So even when we don't run the harvester, there are just as many floaters on the lake. <laughs> so us running or not running won't make much of a difference to that. Um, that will bring me to something exciting I think I have. Um, Cleaning your lake front, which is something nobody likes to do. Something everybody has to do because it's just like your lawn. We have to clean. This is a, this is a perpetual issue that we'll be dealing with. It's maintenance over the long term. Um, one of the things is recently there is a company in Segertown that is a composting company, and there's handouts in the back called Conservation Compost. And they actually have a service where you can get a dumpster, a bin, just like your garbage bin, and they can come up weekly and pick up your compost. So you can put your seaweed in a dumpster and get week weekly seaweed pickup, lake weed, I guess, not seaweed. And you can also actually compost your food scraps as well. 
So if, you want, if you're interested in that, check that out because that is one of the most common questions we get is how do I get rid of these weeds on my lakeshore because I don't have any place to put them. So hopefully that can be a solution to some people that need that. They're willing to do seasonal so you don't have to get all year and it looks very affordable. But all the specifics are, are in a handout in the back. If you or any of your neighbors are interested in that, then maybe that's the solution. Um, our most pressing future spent expenditures are a truck, which our truck is very old. It's the original truck we've had, but it still keeps going along, and we're going to keep it as long as it does. And one of the projects that we keep thinking about and considering is a transport barge. A uh, transport barge is about the, on the same level as a harvester. It doesn't actually do the cutting, but it'll unload the harvester on the water and allow the harvester to continue operating rather than traveling back and forth, and it moves much faster. But that is a piece of equipment we have in our targets to help expand the efficiency and improve our operations and allow us to harvest a lot of weeds. Let's see, make sure I cover all of these points here. Oh, and our biggest risk is hydrilla still. Um, that always is. We don't yet have it in Pontiac Lake, and we are always looking for it just to be on the alert because that'll be a whole different problem to deal with when we have it. Um, some of the handouts I have available for you, um, this is Sydney's handout from her talk, the Seawalls, sea Downspouts, and Docks. Um, it's a little information about Klamath itself. These are all on the back table. You can grab one if you want to give you a little history of us. Um, this is just a little FAQs, and it has some of the included information about the composting on it. This is with the information fact sheet about the hydrilla is very, very useful there. Um, the two mailings that we have, that if you did not get them in the mail list, they are also back there as well. Our upcoming event is the Clama Dance on August 27th. So you can use this order form and leave that here today or send it in. I do anticipate we will sell out quickly because everybody's anxious to go do something fun. <laughs> so we are happy to be on that bandwagon of giving you an event to come and enjoy and have a great time. Then next summer, we do plan to have a plan bash. So that'll be Memorial Day weekend. So for all of you who have missed that, we'll be planning that very shortly. And if anybody wants to help plan, we can always use more, always use more volunteers. August 30th and 31st, we were participating in Crawford Gives, as we did before, which there's a pool of funds that goes to help um, add to the amount of funds that you get. It's not a double or anything, but they will help what's the word I'm looking for, help multiply the funds that you get by getting a portion of their pool as well. So if you like to do it online, that's a great way to do that. Lots of people want to do it online instead of just mailing in a check, but we will certainly take your mailing checks as well. Very easy and there's no processing costs on those. Um, and our, our biggest project is trying to find an, an additional unloading point on the lake. So that's really our biggest bottleneck. We have one at the north end and one at the south end, but nothing in the middle of the lake where we can unload weeds. So it takes a lot of time and a lot of efficiency out of the operation. So if anybody has suggestions about that, we are always welcome to take them. Or if you want to participate in any way, feel free to sign up and let us know what you want to do because we're all volunteers and we can always use more. So I also want to thank, we have a couple of visiting offices and dignitaries here. We have um, Bonnie Smith with Sadsbury Township. We have Alice Battles with Park Wentland's office. And if I missed or don't recognize anybody else, please forgive me. <laughs> And we have a question in the back. The Commonwealth Lake uh, bumper stickers, that's fundraiser or something, uh, where can you buy those? Here? I mean here, but do you sell them anywhere else? Wherever we would be. Okay. <laughs> Wherever we are. We can have them at the dance if you want. Okay. <laughs> or you just mail in your request and I'll get it and you'll get one. Karen, do you have an estimate of what the increase in efficiency would be if you had that transport porch? Yes. I'm going to refer that over. Uh, over 100 percent. Yeah. Wow. When you get a load of weeds on that harvester, it goes about five mile an hour. It takes them an hour and a half to get to the unloaded. That barge would hook on to the harvester, and when that harvester is full, the weeds would go into that barge, and that barge would unhook from the harvester, and the barge would go 25 mile an hour, 30 mile an hour. In addition, the harvester can keep running while the next person takes that and unloads it. So that would be the most cost-effective way of really doing something to, to control this lake. Again, 
it's, it's, a little, it's a little pricey, uh, but uh, uh, you have to do things in a cost-effective manner, and unfortunately, uh, Cranberry does not have an extra, what is it, uh, $70,000 or something for the harvest for, for a barge. But you don't have that kind of money. But but you know, know, it's just it's from um, people like you giving us money. It's 70000 more. That's motorized with the conveyor, I assume. It's almost so like the harvester. It just does not have a cutting um, bar. Um, uh, I was just corrected. It's 130000 for the, uh, right. the bar. Right. So that, that's a significant project because then you need another piece of equipment. You need another dock. You need another place to store it. it increase personnel to run it. So I mean, that really ups the game a lot. But Karen should know it the tonnage of weed. Karen, you should tell them the tonnage of weed we take out right now. With a bar, we would triple that at least. <laughs> Doug? That number is escaping me at the moment. I didn't look yeah, it up this morning, and I don't want to quote it incorrectly. It's written on here. It's 2,000, actually, 2,000 2, pounds per load per truckload out of wet sea we take out of it, and they take that out. Yeah, it's on one of them. On a regular basis, yeah. Mm -hmm. You're talking about tons and tons and tons of weed. Approximately 700 to 1,000 times. Can I ask a question of Sydney? Yeah, absolutely. So I was just curious on the uh, north end of the lake. What uh, did they get permits for more houses on the inland? Uh, you know? Not to my knowledge. So when it comes to houses, um, that's when we're going to get into a little bit more of that chapter 102, which is that erosion and sediment control as opposed to 105, which was the waterway permits and things like that. So when it comes to earth disturbance, really you're re only required to have a permit if you exceed one acre of disturbance. And I'm, I'm not sure that that might be the case up there. I, I haven't seen it, so I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but technically over one acre of disturbance, that is going to require what we call an NPDES permit. Um, so uh, that stands for Nat National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. Would you know if a permit was issued, if there was one up there? To, to my curious. knowledge, um, how long ago do you know where they were? In the going? last two years. I mean, all the land, you know, the farm at the end? Yeah, right. right. They I, did all the dredging and put the dirt up there. I was just curious if there was plans. To my knowledge, I'm not aware of any permits that no were No permits have been issued for that land at all. There we go. So yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> so just one more thing before we get into a lot of questions. I want to thank all of the board members that are here and recognize them. We have Lauren Klarczyk in the back, we have Doug Peters, Judy Stiborski, Bob Santora, Milt Ostrowski, Lynn Sanderson, and myself. I don't think I missed anybody in attendance. Um, thank you for all of you and your interest in coming today. Thank you for the donors because that's what keeps us alive. And just thank you for spreading the word and, and being a supporter of Clamma. So we're going to go into further questions. Yeah, absolutely. How do you know if you have a permit for your dock if you bought it from somebody else? Oh, excellent question. And unfortunately, there's not always an easy answer. So. Um, if you, in the case there is uh, situations where someone has purchased the property and the previous owner has obtained uh, a dock permit, sometimes if you're lucky, that previous owner will give you the permit number and that makes it much easier on me. <laughs> but a lot of times that, that isn't always the case. So it is possible for us to, if you have the name of the previous property owner, we can uh, take a look for some of our physical files and see if we can find that name. Unfortunately, once again, it's still not super, super efficient yet, especially because we didn't always issue those dock permits. Sometimes DEP, you know, before us issued those. And so I know sometimes I think stuff gets lost a little bit, but um, unfortunately, but yeah, so that would be the, my recommendation. If you, if you have a previous landowner's name, we can take a look. Um, and also it would depend a little bit on maybe when the dock was installed as well. I think these dock permits, I guess I'm not entirely sure of the year that it was started, but I think, um, you know, in the nineties, I don't know if anyone, <laughs> um, but it, or not, not very long ago in, in the grand scheme of things. Um, and chances are a lot of times, go ahead, I'm sorry. So the next question is if there was already a dock there before the permitting started. So, excellent question. So, 
this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Well, ultimately, it's still going to require a permit. And we do oftentimes issue permits for dogs that are already existing. Um, you know, it's kind of the, the same process. It seems a little bit silly sometimes for a dog that's already in place, especially with the, the PNDI search that we had talked about here. Um, but at the end of the day, it is still considered a water obstruction. And as a result, um, it, that's when it, it, it would still require a permit. So um, hopefully that answers your question. Charge for the permit? Yeah, so there is a, a permit fee associated. The fee is going to depend a little bit on um, the, the the project. So uh, for dogs, example, that can be covered under a GP2, so those small dogs, the fee for that is typically, um, well, it is always uh, a base fee of $175. Um, it's a one-time fee. And then to run, in order to run the PNDI, that is also an additional $40 fee. Uh, a lot of times people have me run the PNDI for them, it, it, or you can do it yourself if you're comfortable doing that. Um, Either way, it's going to cost forty dollars. So ultimately, that ends up being, I think, about two hundred and fifteen dollars by the end of it. For sea walls, uh, for example, that fee is a, about uh, two hundred and fifty dollars. Once again, with that PNDI, that additional forty dollars, so we're looking at two hundred and ninety dollars. So once again, those are um, one-time fees. Something else I should mention: um, with certain waterways, Pontiac Lake is considered a well, I guess it is considered one of the navigable waterways. Um, and so as a result, an another step to that permitting process is what they call submerged land license agreements. And it's just an added step. It's kind of a, a lease thing with, with the state, with the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, if the dock is covered under a GP2, though, there is no additional fee for that. Um, in other projects, sometimes there is an annual fee. But for docks covered under a GP2, there's no additional fee. But we still have to go through the paperwork for that SLA like with the dock permit. So might be a little bit more information than <laughs> uh, you asked for. But okay. yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm asking for a friend. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I assume you're talking about permanent docks. What about the aluminum docks that are? I'm going to say non-permanent that are taken out of the recall. So these, it, it's going to, I guess, depend a little bit. Ultimately, um, I think they would still require permit coverage. Uh, that's something certainly I can look into a little bit more. Uh, I'm trying to think of how the, the permit GB2 condition is defined. I think it's floating, cantilevered, uh, pile-supported docks. Um, so if it fits under any of those, it, it certainly would still need GP2 coverage. But that, I can get your name after this, and I can certainly get back to you with a more set and so answer if that's okay. Or for your friends, your friends' name. <laughs> is, is there a reward for turning somebody in? No. <laughs> not, this is not that I'm aware of. Where does that money go? Is it to us? fund for lakes or is it just going to the general fund? So with these uh, general uh, permits, this goes, or with the, like I said, general permits, this goes to the, the Crawford County Conservation District um, into our, I guess it would be our clean, Crawford County Clean Water Fund, I believe. Um, and so that goes to be used for, you know, things at the district, um, we do programs and things like that relating to waterways and stuff. Um, I would assume it, it would be pulled out of there. Doesn't go to the state. Well, wouldn't it stay in the lake? They no. Theoretically, stay in the area. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Now, in the case if we were getting to other type of permits, MPTES permits, sometimes there's other fees like that would go to DEP, for example. But for these general waterway permits, um, it would stay. It would stay with the district in Crawford County. Yeah, go ahead. I reckon the majority of docks around the lake are longer than 50 feet. You haven't talked about any GP11. Can yeah. So talk in. About that? Yeah, so I don't issue the GP11s. That comes, that's one of those permits that would come from G, DEP directly. And as a result, um, you know, cert, the, the process is certainly going to be similar, but being that I don't issue those, I don't want to steer you in the wrong direction. And so in that case, I would recommend you know, reaching out to DEP in the case that it is longer than 50 feet. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Typically, most of those can be covered under a GP11. Does that money stay in the area, or do you know where that money goes? You know, I I can't really speak on that. I'm sorry. I don't really know what DEP kind of uses the money for exactly. Um, I, I would hope that it would, but I, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. I know this question's been asked in the past, but is there any way, and I'm not a big fan of increasing taxes, but having a sticker on anyone on the lake that would go to aquatic management or seaweed to help fund I, well, you know, that the seaweed is, cause, clam on, is that the... Um, it, it might be a possibility in the future. It's certainly something I can kind of, you know, have some conversation, you know, we can talk with clam on or I can talk with you guys and um, see if that's something that might be an option. It might be a little bit tricky just because 
Um, these are state permits, they're DEP permits, and so I don't know if, you know, we'd have to get probably the okay from them before we do anything like that, but it's certainly something that sounds like a good project that we can look into. Great. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate it. We have another question. I've been hesitating. Uh, who would I speak with uh, from the Conservation District regarding, there are several streams that, of course, flow into County Lake. I live near Finn Ditch, and I've been there for about 30 years, and I've been noticing more sedimentation. The sandbar is moving north. Most many should know that. And it's sediment coming in primarily from Finn Ditch. And I've noticed over the years, especially after this last week, uh, similar to this last week, that the amount of sedimentation flowing from Finn Ditch into Connie Lake from the air, you could, it looks like a separate Chocolate river. Milk, probably, yeah. And I'm, my question is, is there increased farming up that direction or isn't there? What is changing? So that excellent question, and I can't. I guess I, I'm not super familiar with that area, so I'm not entirely sure what exactly the specific activity is going on. But agriculture is, you know, ultimately it can be a big contributor to to sediment practices. And uh, there are other regulations. We do have an agricultural uh, conservation specialist in our office um, that is much more knowledgeable on the, you know, nutrient management, um, you know, conservation plan type of things from that aspect. Um, so. You know, chances are it, it very well could be uh, attributed to agricultural activity. Um, this might be a question, you know, sir, I, I could certainly talk to Brianna as our, our specialist on agriculture. I could certainly maybe have a conversation with her to see if she's aware of any um, activity in that area that might be contributed to that. And it could just be uh, still water from, uh, from development as well. So there's a number of different sources that it could be from. It could be agriculture, it could be increased development. It could be for poor practices with uh, with most of what Sydney talked about. So it's, it's hard to tell I think that we could do. exactly where the extra water and extra sediment's coming from. But um, where's Finn Ditch? <coughs> Pardon my ignorance. That's what I was going to ask as well. Where the holy cats are? Right over there. It's just north, north of the sandbar. The end of the sandbar. The sandbar. I'll leave it dry. North of the sandbar. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On the west side, they make it to north of the sandbar. Okay. I'll leave it dry. Yeah. Who's responsible for dredging at the north end at the PA Fish Commission launch site? That's a disaster up there. I mean, it's it needs dredge. So where does that happen? That is you know, uh, they were the last ones to dredge it a hundred years ago, and that's who has responsibility. Are they aware of the issue? I mean, you can't even put an inboard there unless you. I mean, you're going to hit your problem no matter what. It's, I'm it's not a aware. disaster. I'm not sure they're aware of it, but uh, I'm not part of the conversation. So. On the question of the dredging, there, I went up and watched what they were doing. They put the, uh, the pipe and repeater uh, pumps between them and the upper end of the park golf course to get rid of it. And from what I understood, and uh, that's what I heard, that uh, I guess the PA Fish Commission was doing that. And I just kind of wonder if we all work together. Because once they come up here, some department was a DEP come in and says, you're doing it wrong. And the Fish Commission put all this stuff out and that didn't get done. So it's about the only thing I think we got done with the client lake. Other than like Tower Point, we go there and make sure they're pretty and stuff. But as far as client lake, we don't get nothing. We have to do it all ourselves. But I did hear that. You heard they were going to do it, but didn't. No, they had equipment in there. They were doing it. At the fish and fish somebody fish. come in, the EG, whatever, I don't know, but they pulled the equipment out. I mean, they ran tubes this big yeah, huge tube. up underneath the bridge to the far end of the golf course. Yeah. Good good soil. Yeah. They were siphoning up there. And they pulled it. They pulled it all out. And that's why it's still like it. When was that that they did that? I would say four, five, six years ago, maybe. That's horrible. Yes. As far, excuse me, as far as sediment goes, the whole far end of the lake is a disaster. They farm that property every year and then the dirt comes into the lake and there's dirt coming in from that stream where the golf course is. Okay. 
It, uh, it's certainly something, like I said, I can have a conversation with our ag specialist and maybe see, uh, do you know who farms it by chance? Or uh, if that's something you don't want to say right now, that's <laughs> probably for the best or whatever. <laughs> but, you know, certainly you can, I can give you my contact information at the office and you can you know, give me a call. But it's more than just that Keep. farm, though, because the dirt that's in front of the Fish Commission launch doesn't come from that farm. That's a separate issue. That's coming down a different tributary. But that's, I mean, you got to fix the problem upstream to dredge it stupid because you're just going to end up with the same problem. Yeah. A lot of those wetlands through there on the west side were historically channelized as well. So what could have worked as a, as a sediment trap or sediment basin were historically channelized prior to regulations and are contributing to sediment as well. So could they be re-channelized? They're, they're I mean, well, not de-channelized, yeah. I guess? I mean, there's certainly opportunities for wetland restoration in those areas. So that might be something um, <coughs> Valley Conservancy is working pretty hard to try to acquire properties in those areas. Who um, is that? Or, or, uh, I'm sorry, French Creek Valley Conservancy. Okay. Uh, so that, that, that would be, help that problem. Yeah. So I mean, that might be a potential for the next phase, you know, acquiring those properties for easements, conservation easements, and then looking at restoration activities on those weapon complexes would certainly help with decreasing amount of sediment that's coming into those areas. So. That might be a logical next step. Uh, the first step, though, is a lot of it's still private property up there. So it's. When you say those properties, are you referring to really contiguous with the lake or even farther out past the golf course? Even farther out past the golf course. There's a number of large wetland complexes. Upstream. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a potential. Just a matter of getting the right pieces and the right people in place. This money we're, we're, we're paying for our docks, and some is yearly and some is uh, long range. Uh, it seems like we, the people here at Conneaut Lake, uh, we don't see any money coming in from, except for when we get our grants. And this lady right here does a great work for us. She's done a great job for us in, in the Sea Week uh, uh, committee here. And it just seems like you know, you're putting all this money into docks and everything, and, and we're not seeing any or getting any help. Just like they wanted to dredge that out. The only kind of freebie launch that we have on Pontiac Lake. Now, your other, one, your other lakes all around, or dams or whatever, they have uh, launches that are maintained. And we had that chance that time to get it dredged. And some in between, like the boys and the girls, they had a fight. and we. And they pulled their equipment out and left, and that was our chance, and we don't have it now. Just like the gas tax, and it's been said that we've never seen a check bought from uh, from No, we do. We do. We never see it. But we do get a check from uh, the marinas and the gas tax. Well, do we? Okay. Yeah. What's that add up to, ballpark? Any idea? Uh, where's Doug? He can answer that. Just, just a few several thousand dollars. It's not all that much money. That's why I thought the sticker on the boat enforced by Fish Commission, I mean, the people that use the lake should be the ones paying for it. Not the, completely, but I mean, that would be the most logical. I mean, the Fish Commission is out there every day, or not every day, but you know, you pay a sticker that's only fair. Fishermen, ski boats, anything with a tag. And the money stays on the lake, which it's made way too logical, but it's <laughs> the solution in my opinion. Excellent. Thank you everybody, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.